Alrighty. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter. I am your host here at Berkshire Museum Family Trivia Night. Uh, as always, when you are participating in trivia, please do not use the internet to look for any answers. Uh, that is cheating. Although I have no way to enforce it other than, you know, the guilt you feel for knowing that you broke a rule. Uh, uh, the Berkshire Museum is also open now for a uh, visit by reservation. You can check out more details on our website. Now, I'm going to get us started with Berkshire Museum Family Trivia Night. Now, uh, today's trivia is on cartoons and crustaceans. So tonight's trivia on cartoons and crustaceans. So our very first question relates to a certain rabbit as we at the museum are currently housing uh, the traveling collection from Warner Brothers, focusing on the Looney Tunes. Now, uh, first one, unfortunately, due to copyrights, I cannot post pictures of these cartoon characters I'm talking about. So here's a lovely 1890s photo of a rabbit. Uh, the, this particular rabbit we're pretending is Bugs Bunny. Uh, now, there were several other rabbits in Warner Brothers cartoons before the official Bugs Bunny appeared. There were several rabbits in, with, you know, the gloved hands. Uh, one of them had yellow gloves. The colors were a little bit different. The voice was a little bit different. So it was a few iterations before the one we know as Bugs Bunny ever showed up. And my question for you guys is, what was the name? So there's sort of a title name and the name of the cartoon. Uh, what musically named uh, broader title, did Bugs Bunny first appear under? Was it one, Looney Tunes, two, Merry Melodies, three, Silly Symphonies, or four, Happy Harmonies? There was a bit of a theme in the uh, uh, 1930s and 40s with these music names for their, their cartoon series. Uh, the big thing was is uh, a lot of theaters you know, sound was relatively recent, getting voice actors could be difficult, and music, especially uh, symphonies and things like that, they were all public domain, so you could use them without having to pay anyone. So which one of these? Was it a Looney Tunes, a Merry Melodies, a Silly Symphonies, or a Happy Harmonies? All right. We're going to end our polling there. It's a small group tonight, so uh, the two of you got it right. It was the first of Merry Melodies. Uh, the Looney Tunes and the Merry Melodies ran in concert with each other. There was no real rhyme or reason why one Bugs Bunny was under Merry Melodies and the other one was under Looney Tunes. In fact, there's a quote from an animator at Warner Brothers in the late 60s, which is, at this point, I don't know if the one I'm working on is a Looney Tunes or a Merry Melodies, and I don't see much of a difference anyway. Uh, so Warner Brothers was running the two of them simultaneously, but there was really no difference between the Merry Melodies and the Looney Tunes by the end. It was really just what banner they ran before it. All righty. Uh, now, Warner Brothers cartoons are obviously a juggernaut in the cartoon world, but there is an even bigger juggernaut that you cannot avoid. That is, of course, Disney cartoons. Uh, the Disney cartoons that were similar to the Looney Tunes fell under the Silly Symphonies title. And while uh, Disney's Silly Symphonies and other animated shorts uh, began winning Oscars almost immediately alongside Disney's documentary efforts, uh, it took a while before their full-length animated feature films first earned an Oscar. Uh, now, almost all the Oscars they were nominated for were for... Uh, uh, either composition or best song. Uh, my question for you all is which one uh, which Disney animated feature film was the first full length film to win an Oscar? Is it one, Pinocchio in 1940 two, Sleeping Beauty in 1959 three, Jungle Book in 1967 or what is it all the way in 1989 with Little Mermaid? Which one was the first Disney full-length feature film to win 
an Oscar. And keep in mind, Disney had won, uh, the Disney company had won numerous Os- Oscars for their shorts. This was the first full length animated film that had won an Oscar for Disney. And it won for, I believe, best original song. All right, another few seconds on your guess. All right. Most of you went with Sleeping Beauty. The correct answer is actually Pinocchio. Pinocchio was the first. Uh, and so Pinocchio, first of their feature film efforts to get an Oscar. However, it would then lead to another long drought before another movie would receive, a uh, feature-length movie would receive an Oscar. Uh, another just fun fact, Disney is the reason for the best animated film category you see in the Oscars. This emerged in the 90s after uh, Beauty and the Beast caused quite a stir. Beauty and the Beast was nominated for a Best Picture Oscar. And then people sort of got very emotional, emotional about whether or not an animated movie could qualify as a Best Picture. And the new category of Best Animated Film was created to make sure that no other animated movie would ever fall into the coveted Best Picture category again. All righty. Uh, another question for you guys. We're going to sh- uh, jump from American animation to Japanese animation. Uh, this particular show took the world by storm. And once again, I do not have the legal rights to show the actual character. So this is a mouse and some lightning. I Hopefully you can connect the two that this is supposed to be Pikachu. Uh, now, Pikachu is, of course, uh, the main character, Ash's first Pokemon. It is his all-star Pokemon and is the iconic Pokemon of the entire Pokemon series, which has been running for over 20 years. Now, my question for you, when we know Ash's Pikachu always stays as Pikachu, but in the, in the games and in the show, what does a Pikachu evolve into? If you were to expose your Pikachu to a Thunderstone, what does it turn into? Or is this all a lie and does it not change? So does your Pikachu change from a Pikachu into a Pichu, a Pikachu into a a Pachirisu, into a Raichu, or does it not evolve at all? And I'm trying to trick you. So Pokemon, the game where you have to evolve your Pokemon in order to get them stronger, Pikachu evolves into this evolved form. Is it Pichu, Pachirichu, or Raichu? Or does it not evolve at all, and I am just being sneaky? All righty, we got our guesses in. And unfortunately for you guys, the correct answer is... Raichu. It begins as a Pichu, turns into a Pikachu, finishes as a a Raichu. Pachirisu is an entirely different Pokemon that is a lightning squirrel, so it's very different. Uh, It looks, it's sort of blue and yellow and not yellow and red. Completely different character. (laughs) Alrighty. Our next question, once again we return to the world of Uh, Warner Brothers, and once again, we return to the world of rabbits. Now, this 1890s photo of a different rabbit is standing in for one Lola Bunny. Lola Bunny first appeared in the 1990s as what is called a distaff counterpart to Bugs Bunny. If you've never heard the word distaff counterpart before, it basically just means opposite gender character of, uh, of your original character. So, if you have Superman, his distaff gar- counterpart would be Superwoman. A distaff counterpart to Wonder Woman would be a character called Wonder Man. Uh, so that's all distaff counterpart means. Lola Bunny was the distaff counterpart to Bugs Bunny. Now, my question was, is when she appeared in the, in, in the 1990s, uh, where was she first introduced? Was she first... 
Did she first show up in Tiny Toon Adventures? Did she first show up in the movie Space Jam? Did she first appear in the Game Boy game Looney Tunes Racing? Or was it in the Baby Looney Tunes show? So Lola Bunny first appeared in the 1990s. What, where did she appear first? Was it Tiny Toon Adventures? Did she first appear in Space Jam? Did she appear in the Game Boy game Looney Tunes Racing before appearing in an animated feature? Or did she appear in the cartoon Baby Looney Tunes? So get your guesses in on where Lola Bunny first appeared. Now, since her first appearance, the character has gone on to appear in numerous other shows, having uh, slightly different characterizations first time. She originally appeared as a tomboy character, very into sports, with a very, uh, you know, uh, strong personality. Later interpretations, she's become a little bit more clumsy, uh, but uh, still very much Lola Bunny. Alrighty, Space Jam took the lead, and you guys are 100% correct. Lola Bunny was introduced into the movie uh, with the movie Space Jam. So that was the first appearance of her character. Fun fact, uh, the original Space Jam movie from the 90s, the website, is still up online. So if you ever want to have a flashback to what the internet of the 90s was, or ever want to show your you know, kids, grandkids, whoever, the internet of the 90s. You can go to the original Space Jam movie website. It is still up in its, all of its 1990s glory. Alrighty. Hooray, my little animation is moving. Uh, so animation has been around for a long, long time. Now, the earliest animated films have been lost to history. Uh, the early 1900s, there are dozens, if not more, of films that have been entirely lost to history. Um, so the very earliest animated movies are lost. However, animation has continued on since then and is a pretty dominant force in cinema. Now, it's almost impossible to determine what country produces the most cartoons, TV shows, and otherwise, because they could not find anyone keeping track of that data. I did, however, find people who figured out how many animated feature films were produced by countries uh, per year. Now, this data is pulled from 2010 to 2015, so I will say this might not be the most accurate since there has been five years since this was uh, pulled, but it was the best data I could find. My question for you all is, which country produces the most animated films per year? Is it France? the United States, Japan, China, or South Korea. And when I say animated, country, uh, animated films, these are feature films. These are the ones that go into movie theater. So full feature films. Uh, so it does not count car uh, cartoons. It does not count sort of uh, animated shorts. These are full length feature films that are animated. Which country produces the most full length feature films on average per year? Was it France, the United States, Japan, China, or South Korea? Another few seconds on those answers. All right, we're going to end our polling there. Uh, South Korea is a great guess. A lot of animating, particularly uh, animated shows for the U.S., are actually animated in South Korea. There are a ton of studios that produce the animation. However, those are still considered American productions as the end result is uh, they are done by an American company and done in English. They are the actual anim animation process is just being handled by a studio in South Korea. However, that's mostly for TV. For films... Japan is produced the most between 2010 and 2015. It beat the United States by one film on average per year for animated features. So Japan produced one more 
per year than the United States. Um, so the Japan and the U.S. are the top producers of animated films. Uh, France, South Korea, and China are sort of the second tier just below. All righty. That brings to an end our animation round. We are now moving on to our second round, the round that I can actually use pictures of the animals because they are not copyrighted. It is time for crustaceans. So this here is a barnacle. You might have seen them growing on various boats, docks, whales. Uh, they are a uh, stationary animal that eats the food that passes by. They have these hard outer shells that they live in, and they will reach out and grab stuff, and they look very terrifying. They are a very, very terrifying looking animal. Uh, and my question for you guys are, are barnacles crustaceans? Simple yes or no. Are barnacles crustaceans? Are they related to crabs, shrimp, horseshoe crabs? Or are they related to clams, scallops, and considered more of a bivalve or a shellfish? So are they related to other crustaceans like crabs, shrimp, lobster? Or are they related to bivalves like scallops, clams, and the like? All right, and polling. As weird as it seems, uh, no was our, was our top answer. As weird as it seems, they are actually a crustacean. They are their own branch of the crustacean family. However, they are far more closely related to shrimp and lobsters than they are to uh, bivalves. This is because they, while they have that hard shell on the outside that they use to attach, their physical bodies are still covered in that exoskeleton. So they are uh, sort of a almost insectoid-like creature that just happens to have this almost coral-like shell that they use to surround their body, but this more insectoid crustacean-type creature lives inside, and that's what reaches out and pulls food in. Uh, so they are actually a crustacean, which is bizarre, um, because they are also very stationary. Alrighty, here we have a nice little shrimp in an aquarium. Shrimp are great because they will do a lot of cleaning for your aquarium. Uh, now, uh, there is a branch of crustaceans called decapods. Uh, this is in reference to the number of legs they have because scientists are very creative and sometimes you just kind of count the numbers of a thing it has and you go with that. Like octopuses being, you know, they got eight legs, so they're an octopus. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of animals, Sometimes you can't get creative naming every single one of them. So there's a branch of crustaceans called decapods. This is a reference to how many legs they have. And my question for you guys is, how many legs does a decapod have? What does decapod mean? Is it eight legs, 10 legs, 12 legs, or 14 legs? How many legs does a decapod make? So if you had to guess, what does the deca in decapod mean? 8, 10, 12, or 14? All righty. We've got all of our answers in, and... It is a great job all around. The deca, of course, means 10. These guys have 10 legs. Now, this usually includes the front arm, which have been modified into various forms of claws, um, but they're still counted with the rest of the legs. So you have the five on each side. It is, to my knowledge, we do not have an animal that has a different number of legs per each side, but I might very well be wrong there. There are a number of strange animals out in the world. So we have our 10-legged animals. Now, in the crustacean family, there are a few living fossils. What living fossils means are animals that have been on this earth for a very, very long time, 
and have not gone through many significant evolutionary changes. Most prominent of these is the horseshoe crab. These guys have been around for millions of years, and they look a little bit alien. They've got a very strange shape. They have a long pointed spike for a tail, and when you flip them over, they got their little legs and little pinchers, and you can very much tell that they're crabby under there. But they are these strange, almost alien creatures, and their blood has actually been proven to be very, very useful in medicine. It is very expensive um, and you know is extracted and used in different medical purposes. But my question for you guys is, what, what color is that blood? Horseshoe crab blood is quite special. It is not based on iron like our blood. Uh, what color is the blood of a horseshoe crab? Is it red, green, purple, or blue? Is it, is it red, like mammalian blood? Is it green, like Spock's blood? Is it purple? I don't know any fantasy creatures that have purple blood. Or is it blue, like uh, the aristocracy? <laughs> so what color is the blood of a horseshoe crab? Red, green, purple, or blue? All right, we have all of our guesses in, and we're going to end our polling there. Purple and blue were the top guesses, and the answer is blue. So they have a blue blood, and unlike us humans who have iron in our blood, and that's what's used to capture the oxygen and move it around our body, horseshoe crabs have a copper compound in their blood. Now, I mentioned Mr. Spock earlier. Vulcans also have a copper-based blood. However, unlike Vulcans, the copper compound in horseshoe crab blood does not turn their blood green. It turns their blood blue. So horseshoe crabs have blue blood. Alrighty, we go from a living fossil to the largest land-dwelling crab in the world. These guys are found all throughout uh, the South Pacific. Uh, this is the coconut crab, so named because it likes to climb coconut trees and eat coconuts. They are also massive. This picture doesn't really do it justice. They are big. Uh, I recommend Googling them. There's pictures of them on like trash cans and they're like the size of the trash can. They're huge. Um, now these coconut crabs, they live on land, they climb coconut trees, and they have powerful claws to tear apart coconuts in order to eat the flesh inside. Now, there are different branches of the crab family. You have your classic crabs, like uh, your fiddlers. Uh, you have your fossil crabs, like your horseshoe crabs, you have your crabs that live in a home, that is your hermit crabs, and then you have your really long-legged deep sea crabs like the king crab or the Japanese spider crab. So my question for you guys is, which one of those crab families is this giant coconut crab most, uh, most closely related to? Is it most closely related to your classic fiddler crabs, you know, the ones with the great big one claw? Is it more closely related to the horseshoe crab, this branch of living fossils, crabs that have really not changed much in millions of years? Is it more closely related to hermit crabs, those small little crabs that, they, that scuttle around and find shells to live in? Or is it more closely related to king crabs, so deep sea crabs with the really long, thin, spidery legs? Which one is our crab most closely related to? All right, we have all our answers in here. I'm just going to give it another couple seconds uh, for those playing the game later. And polling right now. Uh, you guys nailed it. It is hermit crabs. In fact, when you take a look at it, uh, if you look closely, you can really see the hermit crabby shape of this uh, coconut crab. You can kind of see how it is related to hermit crabs. It has a similar face and claw set up. However, unlike the uh, hermit crab, the coconut crab is not finding a seashell to live in. It does not need them. It is big enough on its own.
All righty. We are on to our final question of the night. It relates to, uh, this is a beautiful Dutch painting of a cooked lobster. Uh, it is relates to lobsters, of course. Now, these guys, famous in New England, uh, famously a once a garbage food. People did not want to eat lobster. It was the food that you gave your servants who, you know, you just had to give them something, so you gave them lobster. Uh, and there were agreements written for uh, servants and things like that, where, they, where in the contract it would say that you are not allowed to feed me lobster more than once a week because that is too much time to eat lobster. And has since gained a little bit more prestige as a food source. Uh, now, these lobsters, uh, some people would say that they are immortal. Uh, while they do age and will eventually die of old age, it's they tend to age a little bit differently than humans do. So they just get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, and eventually their size sort of kills them. Uh, now, how old do you think the oldest lobster ever found was? And these are all approximates because the lobster was pulled up from the sea and they had to sort of estimate how old the lobster was. Now, how old, approximately, was the old world's oldest lobster? Was it around approximately 140 years old? Approximately 130? Approximately 120? Or approximately 110? Now, what, one thing we know for certain is that this lobster was definitely over 100 years old. I will tell you, it weighed around 44 pounds. Uh, so it was a very, very large, large crustacean. Uh, if you ate it, it would probably taste really terrible because the older a lobster is, the tougher the meat is, and it's not very good. So a 100-year-old lobster was probably not the best food. All right, we're going to wrap up our polling in just a second. Uh, all right, we're going to end it there. Uh, we had 140 and 120 as our top guesses. And 140 years is correct. The world's oldest lobster was estimated to be about 140 years old. It weighed over 44 pounds. Its claw was, was like the size of my head. The thing was huge. Uh, all right, that is my final question for the night. Thank you all for joining me for this, uh, this evening's session of Berkshire Museum Family Trivia Night. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks as soon as I figure out what the theme for that trivia will be. Uh, until then, uh, if you want to repeat any of our old trivias, you can go to explore.berkshiremuseum.org and you'll be able to find videos of all of our previous trivias there. Alrighty, my friends. Thank you all and have a great night.